perfect. 100% sinless. That not even God could find any fault with Him. And the perfection of that Lamb, the perfection of the sacrifice. And I wanted just to see how, you know, when a Lamb is slaughtered, you know, He doesn't make a noise, He doesn't resist, He gives His life. In the very same way, the Lamb of God gave His life for you. And when He died, just before He died, the sin of the whole world was, he, Jesus was made that sin. And all your sin, I want you to visualize this, and just think of this. See how all darkness that could ever in future, ever in time, anything that could ever come against you as pertaining to condemnation and judgment and all of that came upon the Lamb, Jesus. And see how He died. And with that died your sin forevermore. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> and just for a moment, just experience what it is to be sinless. To be perfect with the perfection of the Lamb. For His perfection was then imputed unto you. His life is your life. You've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. God's approval is over you. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus, we want to thank you for what you were willing to do for us. We want to thank you, Father, for the wonderful plan you had to give us salvation and make us holy with the holiness of God, free from our good works. Thank you, my God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the, <clears throat> the Bible says the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And it says there that the true worshipers, once purged, not many times purged, once purged, shall never again have a consciousness of sin. Isn't that awesome? Let's read that. Open your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 10. It says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. So what it says here is that you can never be perfect under a law system where you need to sacrifice for God. You can never be perfect. In your finances, you can never be perfect before God as pertaining to giving by what you sacrifice for God in your finances. Never. Because you'll have to give again next month and you'll have to give again next month and again, again the month after that to stay perfect. Because what does it mean? Or to, to stay uh, 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 holy before God as pertaining to your giving. What, what does it mean? It means that the last time you gave, that wasn't enough to make you perfect. There was still a need. Now it says here that those that come with sacrifices, in the Old Testament sacrifices, those sacrifices could never make the comer there unto perfect, for, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. So if a sacrifice could have perfected you, Old Testament sacrifice, you'll do it once, and then it will be finished for the rest of your life. Because that thing will have perfected you. But if there's something you must do over and over and over to get God to smile over your life, you must know that the thing you're doing is not working. Okay. That's what verse 2 says. For then would they not have, not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sin. Verse 14. For with one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So what does he say here? He says, if, so, if, if a sacrifice really works, after the sacrifice has been made, the worshiper or the person who brings the sacrifice should not have any consciousness of sin whatsoever, ever again. 
Let's read it again. Hebrews 14, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 1. For, uh, let's read verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. So they came back to the temple to sacrifice again and again and again and again. Why? Because the sacrifice could not get their mind out of the thing that I am a sinner. They had a shortcoming mentality. It didn't work. But now it says here that the true sacrifice, Jesus, once and for all, has forever perfected us through that sacrifice. So that we never again, ever, in future, will have to have any consciousness of sin. Man, isn't that powerful? I mean, while I preach it, and I've been preaching grace for many years, I tell you, my mind, it's as if my mind says, this is too big, man. <laughs> it's like, never again have any consciousness of sin whatsoever. Now, the people came to the temple because they saw God. God's at the temple. Now, when they come to God at the temple, then they were thinking of their shortcomings. Imagine now, you come before God, never again to ever think of one shortcoming ever again, and having your conscience cleared. And your, the, the, the Greek also talks about consciousness. All of a sudden, we're not conscious of sin anymore. We're conscious of something else, much greater, the sacrifice of Jesus. That's awesome, man. Hallelujah. Verse, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So let us draw near with a heart, the full assurance of faith, what does that mean? Faith gives you assurance. What Christ has done gives you assurance that God sees no sin in your life. Assurance. That we can come with a heart sprinkled, washed from an evil conscience. What is an evil conscience according to God, to, to the Bible? It's a consciousness of sin. That's evil. To be conscious of sins. Is evil according to God. We can come now with a consciousness of our righteousness for what He has done. For how many years have we been so effectively coming before God with a consciousness of we are just sinners because of Adam? Coming before God, you know, always deep in your heart, in the deepest part of your belief system, uh, uh, having that shortcoming mentality. Jesus doesn't have that where He is today. And He's your representative. His life is your life. So anything that you think less of yourself than what God thinks of Jesus, you're just, just deceived. I'm just deceived in that area of life. So God has come and has given us this awesome, awesome life. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about the heart of man. That was just for free. Okay. <laughs> it just came up while I was... Right. Then talk about the heart of man. I, I think this is one of the, the um, most fundamental teachings supposed to be preached in the church. If we can understand, you know, what the gospel is and how we can deal with our own heart, our own belief system, how our own belief system can be reprogrammed and how easy that is, you know, we can see God living our life. We will actually have the life of God. It's not you trying to be good, not you trying to be uh, nice, not you trying to live holy, not you trying to do anything. But where God lives it in you. Amen. That's what we want. Right, now the word heart, um, in the Greek talks about the emotions, the emotion of your thoughts. Or the emotion of your mind. That means, when you think of something, what you feel when you think of it. That is your heart. And your heart is your belief system. What you believe with or the subconscious mind. Um, so when you think of something, when you think of a bill you must pay, for instance, the emotion that comes in your heart, the emotion that comes to your mind, that, that, that which you feel, that is your belief system, what you actually believe. Belief produces that emotion. And it's impossible by human willpower to change that emotion. 
It cannot be changed. You cannot say, well, um, I'm not going to feel rejected. You can use your will to try and handle the rejection you feel. And you can, after a while, uh, be you can become very fit with willpower and handle it to a certain point. You know, you just handle your emotions, you, you just handle all those things, you know, by willpower. But God has not intended that for you. God has intended for us to feel what He feels. To feel happy. <laughs> to feel loved. To feel no fear. To feel peace. Like, I mean, what made Paul sing in the jail? Think about all that. Paul was there in the jail and he was singing songs of worship, being beaten. Not being jealous of the guy next door that's got maybe a cell that's one meter bigger than his. You know? But he's got a joy in his heart <laughs> about who, who, who he is. See, there's something else, a different point of reference that brings an absolute joy. So when he was thinking of, I'm in jail, the thought of jail and the thought of sitting in jail for the rest of his life, the emotion that came with that was joy. Now it's not, I must try and be like Paul. It is, what did Paul believe that brought forth that joy? It's, let me give you a good example. Imagine you, 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 uh, you've got a car and you... Um, um, you the, this company gives you a, a car and the car breaks. And then the boss says, listen man, if the, we're going to have this car fixed, but if it breaks again, you get a new car. And you, you, your boss always does what he says. So what do you believe about his word? You believe his word is true. Because in his actions and in his character and in, in, he, in, in who he is and how he portrayed himself over years, brought forth a belief system in your heart that you cannot change just in a moment. Because who he is, is the, uh, your belief is a result of who he is. And all of a sudden here you drive and, you, and there it happens. The car breaks. Are you going to be sad? No. <laughs> because what you believe produces a joy. You didn't decide to be happy. You didn't resist anything. You didn't say, well, I resist being disappointed in this car and I, I'm going to try to be happy that I'm going to get a new one now. No, no. Your belief produced the joy even when your car broke. So if, that, if that's how it works in this normal world. And that's exactly how it works between us and God. If we can hear what God says, and the character of God can be portrayed as a person that is trustworthy when He speaks to you. Like for instance, He says, listen, I will provide for you. So when a thing happens that it looks as if He's not going to provide, or as if there is not money, I mean joy comes to your heart. My God provides for me. Amen. That's just the way it is. You know, I've, I, 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 I didn't know... I don't know if I said it um, last Sunday, um, but we moved out of the office that we, we were in, and it was a big thing to get out of that office because I had a two-year contract. And I wanted to get out of that thing. And, um, you know, but when I looked at the natural thing, my mind said to me, the normal mind said, well, I look at the contract and I will, I will not be able to get out of this. But because of what I've seen about God... In my heart, when I thought of that, I just, there was just a peace. Well, even if I rent this place for another two years or, um, or whatever, it doesn't matter. There was just a peace because I know that my God always provides. Now, I didn't decide to, to say, well, I'm going to now believe that God provides. No, no, that belief was a result of the, 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 the correct information that we've received. So the heart of man is the very thing you believe with. It is what your life consists out of. What you believe, how you believe about God, is the way you live in this life. Is, it determines how you handle problems, what you think. It determines all the emotions that comes to you. Amen? If, you, if I tell you the word, like I said last time, if I say the word judgment, I mean, what emotion comes to your heart? 
if I say the word uh, uh, forgiveness, or if I say forgiveness of your neighbor, or you must forgive your neighbor, what comes to your heart? What emotion is assigned to that word? Now, if, if you sit with a doctrine that says, if I, do, if I don't forgive my neighbor, then God cannot forgive me, my goodness. The moment you, you hear about your neighbor and what he's done, it's like my one friend, you know, he's, he had his, I'm just thinking of Oriya now. They built at his house, and he said, man, you know, that he's, at this house, you know, this builder just messed up and what and what and what. Now, you know what I've also realized? Every builder always messes up. I haven't heard about a guy that says this builder did a perfect job. <laughs> I've never heard about it. So the poor builders, you know. Well, anyway, so th this builder messed up. So if I must say to him, the forgiveness of God and the builder, what emotion will come to his heart? If he believes, Matthew 18 says, that if you don't forgive your neighbor from your heart, then 17, 70 times 7 in a day, then God will not forgive you. I mean, condemnation will be in his heart. You know? And from that foundation, he will live. Because of a certain doctrine that came through Scripture. But the truth about that is, that in the Old Testament, that is exactly how it worked. But the New Testament says, forgive one another as Christ has already forgiven you. So Old Testament, you've got to forgive to get forgiveness. Old Testament, you've got to give to receive money. Old Testament, you have to live holy to be blessed. New Testament, God has blessed you, therefore the fruit of holiness comes forth. God has forgiven you, therefore you forgive because of the revelation of forgiveness. It's not live holy and I'll give you a new life. It is I'll give you a new life. And have the revelation of the new life, and you'll find a new life manifesting in your life. Amen. Completely. So if, when your belief system about God changes, then you find you can hear more about God. Another thing, in 1 in, in, in John it says that um, if your heart does not condemn you, whatever you ask, you will receive from God. And, and you must read those words carefully. It says, whatever you ask, you will receive from Him. So when we ask God as pertaining to certain things and we don't have condemnation in our hearts, then what we receive about what we ask will be of Him. For instance, I, say, I might say, God, you know, I want a big airplane. But if I don't come with condemnation before God, you know, well, I feel I must have that to go and preach the gospel, otherwise God's going to be angry with me. If I've got no condemnation, the answer I receive then about that thing will be from God. But if I come with condemnation and I ask, the Bible says though a man with a double-minded double, double minded or double-hearted is unstable in all his ways and he mustn't think that what he gets comes from God. So what it is, is it doesn't say you're going to get everything you ask. The answer pertaining to what you ask will come from God. You will hear God. Amen. And that's wonderful. Because I come with no condemnation. There's no sword over my head about this thing. So I can ask with no condemnation. So there's nothing pushing my heart in a certain direction to force my ear to hear something from God. So I can ask and hear. That's how simple it is, because my heart is not condemned. When you go before God with a heart that's condemned, that condemnation will speak to you. That condemnation will guide you. That condemnation will have its voice of five things to do to get rid of the condemnation, and you will go and hear now to hear from God, but you'll hear other voices as well. But when you go with no condemnation, conscious of the perfect Lamb, when you ask what you receive there, what you hear, the emotion coming in your heart, in that place, will be from God. Hallelujah. Amen. It's about, it's, it's, it's like, um, man, I, I forgot your name. Kim. I, I, you know, Kim spoke to me before the time, and she said, they, you're going to immigrate to Australia. Okay, they're going to go to Australia in November. 
So here, she says, before, maybe they should have made the move long ago. But we've been so programmed in our hearts that you cannot do anything before you've got three words from God. Confirming. So now you don't even go and ask. And even if you ask, you hear from that perspective because your heart, only, you can only hear what you believe. So what you will hear is, where's the word? Where's the confirmation? Where's the prophet? I don't say they've done it, but what would normally happen is you will go and see where's the next prophetic meeting. And you'll go there to get a word from God, to hear God, what must I do? So what you hear there, go to that meeting to get a word from God, was not from God. But if you had no condemnation, and you go there, you'll be able to hear what God says about that. You know, you can maybe hear something like, goodness and mercy will follow you wherever you go. Oh my goodness. You know, it's not, well, I will, you better follow me, otherwise my goodness is going to leave you. You know, goodness and mercy will follow me wherever I go. So the heart with which we ask will determine what we hear. That's why it's so important to have our hearts pure before God. A pure heart, now I want to say a pure heart is not a pure motive. A pure heart is a belief system that's washed from all condemnation and sin consciousness, even if you have sins. I need to add that in there. No sin consciousness comes from a consciousness of something that took away all sin. Because what you need to hear, if you are addicted to drugs, if you are addicted to things, you need to hear who you really are and how perfect you are in order for you to be set free from that. Because what you believe is who you are. So you will not be able to be free from the things that bother you. You will not be able to be free from depression. You will not be able to be free from wrong thoughts unless you can believe that you are free. Now how are you going to hear that you are free when you go with sin consciousness? You'll never. You'll be stuck forever. And you'll work there forever to be free and you'll never be free. You'll go into, into willpower, a, a, a willpower gym and work up your willpower muscles and then the good life that comes forth out of you will be born from your own power and not even born from God. Man, I haven't even gotten into the verse. First verse. Okay, the heart. The Bible says Romans 10 verse 9 10, with the heart we believe unto righteousness. So the heart is our belief system. It is, is how we believe. The word belief means it's the resting of the mind. You believe in something when your mind goes to rest when it comes to that thing. Like for instance, when, when do I believe in a Christian perspective? The negative perspective is when, when do you believe in a thing negative? It's when you, when, when you think of that thing and fear comes to your heart. Belief, now that's, that's unbelief. Belief is when you think of that and your mind goes to rest. You've got this peace. That cannot be faked. It is a fruit of God. It's a fruit of the revelation of Christ. So with a heart, we believe unto righteousness. Your heart is the emotion that comes, your heart reveals itself in the emotion that, comes in to, that, that you experience when you think of things. Okay, now, we are not into uh, 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 emotion modification. So don't try and feel different things. You don't have to fool yourself. If you feel something, that's what you feel. Like I said last time, we've been taught so much in, in, the, in, the, in the old faith, faith movement that you should never do what you feel. You should be so scared of what you feel. You know, because we don't do what we feel. We do what the Bible says. So we never feel like it, but we do it. Now let me tell you something, you know. If my wife loves me, and she cooks for me, and does things for me, and she does it, and she doesn't feel to do it, but she does it, it's dead. What I would like is that she feels that she wants to do it, and that what she does is a result of what she feels. As simple as that. 
So exactly the same with God. He has come to bring a truth that can work up an emotion in your heart that brings forth rest, which is rest. That is belief, believing in the gospel. Amen. Believing in the gospel. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 20 verse 6. We're just going to touch on two scriptures that I've mentioned last week and then we'll go into some new ones. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 6. Now, just before I read this, you cannot, and I mentioned this, I want to just elaborate a little bit, you cannot see things outside of your belief. This is just simple. You first believe something, when you believe it, when you're persuaded of something, everything you see from that day is in the framework of what you believe. It's like I said, you know, if, if, if you don't like, a, like with me, I like, a, I like Suzuki motorcycles. So when I look at a Harley Davidson, what comes to my mind? Noise pollution. <laughs> That's all, you know. It... it Harley Davidson, what does it stand what what does it stand for? Hardly dangerous. That's how slow the thing is. You know, so it's <laughs> I mean, because my belief has is in a certain place, I cannot see. I mean, even if they make a faster Harley, then I will say you're first time in their life. You know, it's like I cannot see anything good. Be not because it's bad, but because of what I believe. In the very same way about God. Before you believe that God's good, you will never be able to see good things. You know, I've, I've seen, especially on Facebook now, you get comments on certain things you do, you know, and, and then the, uh, certain of the clips I put on. And then on these comments, you will see how a person cannot reason outside of his belief. Be it grace or law or whatever, you know. He cannot reason outside of that. There was somebody once I spoke to that, that's an atheist on, on, on Facebook. So this guy, I think he's from Pretoria. I come with facts that is, I mean, there's, there's no way that you can reason around it. He will, he, he just, he'll, he'll, he will never answer that. Just leave it. You know, oh, I'm not going to answer that. I'm just leaving that and I'm going on with what I think. It's like this default setting. And anything outside of that, the computer just goes bzzz, and it just goes on. Now that's exactly how God made us. And that's how we should function. When it comes to grace, we, get, we should be one-track one minded. God is only good. If God is good, it means God loves me. It means He's got an emotion of love towards me in a way that's easy for me to understand. And in this emotion of love, and that is good for me, He's not going to test me. He's not going to put me through hard times to purify me. Because His blood has made me pure. Like I said, if hard times can purify you, you know, then pe the people that suffer the most must be the purest. But you can find the people that suffer the most, they are drunk every day. You know? They will sleep around, they will do things bad, they will murder. Who's the people that are in jail the most? The rich or the poor? I mean the poor, those that suffer. In jail they make you suffer even more and it doesn't make them holy. You'll find all kinds of sin in jail. I, I spoke to people that said to me, I went to jail and I only had one bad thing I did which was not actually that bad. But there I became a criminal. Now does that hard time purify them? No ways. So it cannot be ascribed to God that God will put me through hard times to purify me. Now, you will not be able to hear that unless you first come to a place where you are willing to hear that God is good and when you hear and the thing jumps in your heart, God is good, that you cultivate that. And say, I, this is what He gives me, this is His love for me and I'm going to cultivate that with all my heart. And as you cultivate that, you'll find that you start to think in that pattern. And you will only hear God's good. Every scripture you read will be about how good God is. Everywhere you'll go, you'll see the goodness of God. doesn't matter what bad thing happens. You will just see, man, look how good God's been here. Then, then something else bad happens. You'll say, but look how good God's here. And with that, and, and it brings forth a positive attitude. It brings forth life in you. 
Not that I say it will just go bad, but it doesn't matter what happens, you will still, be, still have joy. And if it goes very well with you, your joy will not be in how well it goes with you, but still in God and what is done for you in Christ. Right, Genesis 2, 20, verse 6. Did I say 6? Listen to this. And God said unto him in a dream, This is now Abraham's wife. It was given to another king. This king took her in, and now he's, I mean, in that night or the next night, he's going to sleep with her. But she belongs to Abraham. And God said unto him in a dream to this king, Yes, I know that you did this, in, in the integrity of your heart. Now what happens here is, this guy, God came to him and said to him, you're going to die because you're going to sleep with Sarah and she's not your wife. She's the wife of Abraham. You're going to die. This is a sin. Then he says, God, will you judge me because I didn't even know. Then listen to what God said there. And God said, said unto him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. That word integrity in the Hebrew is the word innocence. You did this in the innocence of your heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. So what, what happens? He says, listen, this thing you did with innocence in your heart, therefore I withheld you from sinning. Now that's big, man. When we start to live a life with innocence in our heart, not innocent because of what we've done, when our belief system is flooded with the innocence that comes from the cross and the revelation of the cross of Christ. When, when that happens, we will find that God will start to resist sin in our life. It will not be us who decide to feel good, us who decide to, 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 to stop to sin, us who decide to live a holy life. We will find that it will be God resisting it in us. And that's exactly what you want. When you can believe that you are truly innocent, Innocent with the innocence of the Almighty God. Now, if you don't believe in your heart that you're innocent, what you need to do, it's very simple, is hear the Word. The Bible says that the sower goes and he sows the Word. The seed falls in the heart of man. The, the, the sower sows the Word. The seed that falls in the heart of man. In some places, it falls on a stony heart. In other places, in a heart with, with the stones and thistles. In other places, good, good soil. So where does the word fall? It falls in the heart anyway. So whenever you hear the gospel of His unconditional love, mercy and grace, it falls in your heart. And it will produce fruit. Amen. So what do we do? How do we get our hearts in the gospel? How do we get our hearts to believe the truth and to have a good foundation? Very simple. Just hear the word. That's it. There's only one thing we do. You listen to the gospel of grace and you'll see what happens. That's it. It's one of, one of the most powerful things you can do is just to hear how much God loves you. Think of your kids, man. Now you know they want to play with those other kids. That's not good kids. And now your kid says, No, mommy, I don't want to go anywhere with him. At school, we just talk. We just talk. That's it. You don't talk to him. Because he's going to influence you through his talk. Isn't it? That's where everything starts. This guy told me, let's go and do this. Let's try. It's innocent. Let's go. Let's do it. Whatever. And he talks you into it. Everything we do, we are talked into in, to a certain degree. In the very same way, we are talked into grace by the Word of God, by hearing what He says, programming our hearts. What I also said last week was, this woman, uh, 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 this guy came, Abraham sent him to find a wife for Isaac, and, um, and he had to get Rebekah. So he said, God, I don't know which woman I need to get. This, this Abraham said, I must just go, the angel will show me. Imagine you send your, the someone, listen, go and find a wife for my son. The angel will show you the right one. Then you bring her here. Okay. <laughs> there he goes. Oh, God. You know, this, this master, the God of my master, because maybe the God he believed in didn't, couldn't help like that. So the God of my master, please, the woman that brings water here and gives to me and my, the camels, she will be the one. And the Bible says, while he was speaking in his heart, 
Rebecca Cain. That word speaking in the Hebrew means to arrange with words. While he was arranging his heart with words, we arrange our belief system by the words that we speak in our hearts, speaking in your heart. I don't, we don't have to go, I'm, a, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Listen, man, you can go and say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, until you're blue in the face and everybody around you think you're, you're a lunatic and after a while you'll think it because you, are, you don't see any blessing and it's not going to help. It needs to be spoken in your heart. It means it needs to address your belief system. So, if I tell you you are blessed, the first thing you're going to ask me, you're going to tell me, why? Why are you saying, I'm blessed? It's like somebody comes to my house. Imagine somebody knocks at the door at your house. I've had friends do that. And they say, man, who comes smiling? I say, okay, so like smile young. But why? No, man, we are going on a bike trip. Okay, now I can smile. You've given me the reason why I can smile. I need to believe something in order for that smile to come forth. Otherwise, it is fake. It's not what God intended for us. So for you to have peace, you need to hear something that produces the peace. Otherwise, you're never going to have peace. Christianity is not a behavior modification. It is a revelation of the truth about you that will, will rearrange your belief system so that the fruit of God can come forth in your life. That's what, that's what Christianity is all about. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. Amen. Let's go to, uh, uh, or I'm just going to quote this, John, John 13, the last part, Peter comes to Jesus, he says to Jesus, Jesus, I, I will die for you. I'll sacrifice myself for you. Okay? Then Jesus said, listen, now this is what he said, he says, I will die so that I can be with you. Jesus says, no, you will be with me, but not now. Then he said, but I will die and go with you. Jesus said before the rooster crows, you would have denied me three times. Okay? Then chapter 14, verse 1. So what was Peter thinking of? He was thinking of what he had to sacrifice to be where Jesus actually wanted him one day. It was, I'm going to sacrifice to be with Jesus. I'm going to sacrifice to be at the level of Jesus. Then chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus said unto Peter, Let not your heart be troubled. Your belief system, the way you believe about how you will be where I am is troubled. Because you've come forth with your sacrifice to be where I am. You've come forth with your sacrifice to be righteous. Your belief system is troubled, Peter. You will deny me. For your belief system has been troubled. How do you trouble your belief system? With sacrifice teaching. Sacrifice this, sacrifice this, sacrifice this. And exactly what it says there, the true worshippers, once purged, will not bring all these sacrifices anymore. Because they will believe they are pure. They will have no more consciousness of sin. But you know the, the sacrifice Christ came... And it brought, took away all sin that no Christian ever again should have any consciousness of sin. But it's been so watered down in our preaching that we cannot even dare to think that way. You know, we've been talking about a, 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 a conf sin confession and a guy from Jacob's Dahl phoned me. He said to me, Beth, you know the sin confession thing. Should we confess our sins or shouldn't we confess our sins so that God can forgive us? I said, no, no, he died for the sin of the whole world, man. It's like, okay, the sin of the whole world was in Jesus. Then Jesus died. And when he died, the sin of the whole world died with him. Okay, now, and that people believe. But now when we come and say, should I now confess every day if I've done something wrong so that God can forgive me, all of a sudden this truth doesn't exist anymore. This is the truth. So what happens if I do something wrong every day? No, no, go and realize what Christ has done for you. Hear the word of God as pertaining to that and you'll find your heart will change and a new life will come forth. The Bible says out of the heart issues your life. It's like a well. 
It issues forth water. A spring issues forth. It comes out of your heart, issues your life. Out of how you believe about God, issues your life. So Peter's, Peter had a heart that was flooded with trouble. You know? Why? Because he was thinking of how he should sacrifice. The best thing you can ever do when it comes to your heart is to say, Lord Jesus, you know, I want to just have one thing in mind. I want to believe what you have done for me and what you have done as me. For when he was living on this earth, he was living as you. He was living your life. Not his life, your life. When he was obedient, you were obedient. When he was holy, you were holy. When he's righteous, you're righteous. And when we come, can come before God with the innocence that Jesus has, not because you've done everything right, but because he paid for you. When you can come with that innocence, I've seen it so many times, you know, when, when somebody owes somebody else money, he owes a shop money, he will not visit that shop. Or if he goes there, he will go there and walk in a certain way. Because there's people that owe money. I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen friends, I've seen people, you know, they owe people money. When the phone rings, they will not answer that phone. Because that, he knows that God wants the money, man. And he can't pay. It's a problem. He, there's certain shops that he wants to go to, but he can't because he owes money. But if somebody would come and pay that debt for him, You'll find maybe after a couple of months, you'll walk in there a bit guilty, and, but you'll still buy something. And after a year, you will walk in there with innocence. As if nothing ever happened. And you'll buy with boldness. So you cannot benefit from that shop unless you've got innocence. So how do you think we're going to benefit from God without having innocence? Now God knew that no man could ever be innocent by his works. So he came and made every person innocent. So that we can come and benefit eternal life through the innocence of Christ. Hallelujah. You know, this is the good news, man. This is the gospel of his grace. I, I've said so many times in this church, I say to you again and I say to myself, we are innocent, man. With the innocence of Jesus. Something can only lose its grip on you when you realize your innocence about that thing. It's like maybe you've messed up in life, you know, in certain areas of your life. Now you find that, that you are still bearing the consequences. But now for how long must you now bear the consequences? For the rest of your life? No way. The moment you'll get rid of that con those consequences is the moment you believe your innocence. Because it's the consciousness of your guilt that's bringing forth the... It's it causing God not to manifest things in your life. It's like sickness. Say, for instance, you've smoked. Now you've got cancer, lung cancer. Now in the beginning, you will think, oh, you've had the loan from the saunders, he do it, you. Is it he? <laughs> the wages of sin's death. I've done this now. Okay, maybe it happened that way. You were smoking, now you got the cancer because... Say it is be, just because of the smoking. When will you be healed from that cancer? When you can believe what the sacrifice has done for you so that you are seen as innocent. And from that innocence gushes forth the life that brings forth the healing in you. See yourself as innocent. Man. Innocent. Amen. It's like with finances, you know. I felt um, in my heart the Lord spoke to me. I I would like, there was a time in my life I would never speak about money. I'll only preach certain things and then a little bit about giving or so. But I will not actually because I, f I felt I should speak about this but I don't want to speak too much about that. And then when I got released from that was when God, saw, God spoke to me and said to me, why do you live with the guilt of another man's sin? I mean, I didn't even manipulate anybody for money. Never. But now I don't want to talk about money because somebody else abused people. Now I come and I take the guilt of those people on me. Now I don't want to talk. No, no, no. We talk about, we can talk about money. It's a good thing. The, 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 Paul clearly states, he says, say, say to those that are rich, and I want to say to the people here that are rich, that has got money, give to those that have need. 
give to them. That's it. Simple. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a big thing. It is clear in the scripture. That is how God has made us. God has, he, he, says, he actually says, command those that are rich to give to those that are poor. And help those that struggle. And to tell those that have got money to be abundant in good works. Talking about giving money away. And helping, giving food and all those type of things. But if I come with guilt in my heart, I can never live the life that God has intended for me. I will rob people from the truth because of guilt in my heart, even if it is a second-hand guilt that I took from somebody else. Because other people do that. I don't want to be associated, so I can't. No, I'm innocent. Yeah? With the innocence of Jesus. So we can just speak the truth. Hallelujah. Amen. So I want to tell you, the platform, and the moment, uh, the, the, this platform of, of innocence is in our hearts, we find the life of God gushing forth. Not you trying to live holy, a new life. The way you speak to people, the way you relate to people, is all changed. Because you see their innocence. You start to talk to people as if Jesus has paid for their sins. Remember, remember the example I gave. Say I take um, uh, uh, the guy that works in my garden and I tell him, listen, we're going to buy a lotto ticket. Me and you. I'll pay your tickets for you. Now say he lives in a place where he doesn't have TV or any way to know the lotto numbers. So it's on his name but I keep the ticket at my house and I'll tell him, I'll phone you when the ticket, uh, if the numbers are correct. And now in that lottery, I win a million and he wins a million. Now I, I'm so happy, I won a million. Hallelujah! I go and I buy and I do and I get rid of a lot of, I get delivered from a lot of things that I've been struggling with. But I don't tell him about his. Just quiet. You see, the moment I realize his prosperity and his wealth, then it energizes me to speak to him in a certain way. In the beginning is it, oh you are not. You know? If he's if if he if he was the only one that won won the ticket, you got manier. Isn't it? Because your revelation of what he received changes your attitude. In the same way, Jesus has been given to the whole world. And that changes your attitude in how you see people. Amen. You know, it was, it's like, um, you know, when I see somebody struggles with a certain thing, you know, it's like I don't want to give up hope to continue to speak grace to him. Because I know that this guy has, God has already paid for him. He just doesn't realize this. He doesn't understand. Sometimes I will willfully not speak to him and send somebody else. Because maybe he doesn't hear it in the way I try and present it. But I'll make effort. And I'll, I'll I want this guy to hear it because of the revelation of who he is. Because your belief system will allow it. Imagine you know somebody that is very poor and they won 10 million rand. And you tell them, listen man, you received 10 million rand. You don't have to live in a shack anymore. And they don't believe you. Are you going to say, well, that's a case between the guy who gave the money and him. There's a privat sock. A prati da worry. A gloss home no more. You're not going to do that. You're going to say, hey man, let me prove to you. You'll go to the bank, you'll get friends, you'll, you'll get whatever proof in whatever way to get him to believe this. Be not because you, you're thinking of how poor he is, but you're thinking of what he has already received. And that all comes out of not, I must win the lost or I must convince people. It comes out of a revelation of what has happened to people. Amen. So our hearts... Our hearts is there. Let's just read one more verse. Our hearts is the foundation from where we live. We reprogram our hearts by rearranging our hearts with words. Now this is a very important thing. and We, we shouldn't be scared of this word. The word meditate. You know, we, we think it's a new age thing. Listen, it's an old age thing. 
David talked about meditation. Meditate just means to think very deep. Very, very deep. It's like, uh, uh, I think I told you last time, it's like with me, when I think of something, when I think of, say, between me and somebody, I will think, well, I'm going to, um, like with, a, with, a, with, with this office thing now. So I will be there in my office, alone. And then my wife will be outside, you know, in the garden or somewhere. Then she will say to me, who are you talking to? She says, no, I'm Derek. Says, What's he saying? No, he doesn't want to give up the office. But I've been speaking in my mind. He's not there. I'm not phoning anybody. It's just in my mind. I see myself going to the shop. Going, phoning Wom Derek, speaking. Uh, in my mind, I say, from hello, Wom Derek. I say, hello. You know? <laughs> he speaks to me, and I speak to him. And we've got an argument there. You know? That's meditation, man. That's exactly what it is. And some people go into deeper meditation than other people. <laughs> I always speak to myself. Yesterday, the day before yesterday, I picked up Aubrey. You know, so... Then I had a misunderstanding of where I should pick him up. So I first went to the other place, and then I had to drive back and get him. Now I'm a little bit frustrated because we're visiting people. Now I'm driving up and down in, in town for nothing. So I pick him up, and uh, on the way back I said loud, He said to me, Papa, what say you? I <laughs> said, so it's like, you know, that is, that's a type of, it's when something that is not even real there becomes so real that it manifests. It, it, meditation literally means to mumble softly, to speak to yourself. That is what it is. What, when you, you start to think of, like I did this in the beginning of the service, think of the Lamb of God. Think of your perfection. Think of... Uh, how sinless you are. Think of how righteous you are. Picture it in front of yourself, man. Start to speak. Even if it's just an imagination. Start to speak. Think of yourself as perfect as Jesus. Or as Jesus. If you want to do it that way. That's the only way your mind will allow it. And then start to have a conversation with God. Start to think what God and Jesus talks about. You know? And, and start to hear that. And you know that's how God speaks to you. That's what He says about you. You are not Jesus, but you've, been, you've received the righteousness of God, so you've got the same stand before God as Jesus. So why shall we come with an inferior heart, an inferior belief? And it's so important to protect this belief system because out of that flows your life. The way you'll do business, the way you'll speak to people, the way you think of the future, your emotions about your family, your emotions about everything in life, comes and is born from your belief. So we, this belief, that's why the Bible says it's impossible to be saved without faith. It's impossible. Because salvation is this change of life, this new thing that will come when Christ returns. All of that is on the basis of a change of belief. What you believe. And God has come, brought something that's really true, so that you will not be in believing something and at the end of it find, well, it's affected my life, but there was no truth behind it. He made something true, and that is your innocence. And now we can declare that those that can believe it will be saved from the condemnation they are in. The kingdom of God doesn't start one day. It's already here by the Holy Spirit. There are different ways of manifestation that will still come, like the glorification of our bodies and those type of things, but we are already here. Jesus said, if I cast out the devil by the finger of God, which is the Holy Spirit, he says, then the kingdom of God has come close to you. Isn't that awesome? It says, the will of the, will of the Father to give you the kingdom. His way of doing things. That's, that, that's how I define kingdom. His way of doing things. I mean, if you're in my kingdom, you do it my way. If you're in that guy's kingdom, you do it his way. We are in God's kingdom, we're doing it God's way. God's way is, I'll do it in you or it will not be done. You rest, I do. That's God's kingdom. There was Mary. I end off with this. There was Mary and Martha. What did Mary do? She sat at his feet and listened to the teaching. The other one was 
serving. She was troubled with much serving, the Bible says. Troubled with much serving. I want to tell you the church is troubled with much serving. Troubled. What, what happened to Peter? Don't let your heart be troubled. What was he troubled with? Much serving. He was willing to even die. So that he can be where Jesus is on the basis of his obedience. Jesus obeyed on your behalf. Let our heart not be troubled, but let our hearts be flooded with the revelation of his love for us. And as our hearts are flooded with the revelation of his love for us, I tell you, you will find the life of God come into you. And it will not be a troubled life. It will be a joyous life. A life of absolute peace, man. You know, I look at pastors, and those of you that watch by the internet, maybe you're a pastor that's watching me right now, and, and you're tired of church. You're tired of, 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 of religion. You're tired of all these practicalities of religion. That's exactly what Ma uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says. Come to me, all you that are um, overburdened and heavy laden. That, in, in the Greek, uh, it means all those that are overburdened with the practicalities of religion. If you're overburdened with the practicalities of religion, Jesus says, come to me. If you are tired of building a church and building a ministry, you can come to Jesus. What makes you tired is just simply this belief of, I must build a ministry to be pleasing to God. You don't have to have a big church to be pleasing to God. You don't have to preach all over the world to be pleasing to God. We are declaring over you that you are pleasing to God and that you can rest, my friend. Hallelujah. Amen. That you can rest. Thank you, Jesus. We cannot sacrifice the sacrifice of Jesus for the preaching of the gospel. Let me say that again. We cannot sacrifice the sacrifice of Jesus for the spreading of the gospel. We live in His sacrifice and from there we spread the gospel. We cannot give up the grace message and a, a life free from works to be righteous before God for the spreading of the gospel. What does it help that I believe, I preach grace, but I live in the law? As a preacher, I'm just killing myself, man. I'm just killing myself. Let's pray together. <clears throat> I just feel in my heart I would like to pray for people that feel a little bit burnt out. Maybe you're watch, watching over the web. <clears throat> Maybe you're watching this live. Maybe it's five years from when I preach this. I want to just say, if, if, if you have got the emotion in your heart of I've tried so hard and I don't know when my willpower is going to fail me, but I'm going to try one more time. I can't face failure. And out of fear of failure, I'm trying again. I want to tell you, Jesus wants to save you from that today. If you are here today. I want to tell you, there's a time for rest, a time of rest for you between you and God. The innocence of Jesus is declared over you. The innocence of Christ. You don't have to run helter-skelter. You don't have to... Or any, you can come at, and get at peace at His sacrifice. What He's done is enough. What He's done is enough. You don't have to add anything for God to be pleasing to you. You don't have... When Jesus died, all your disqualification died. He died, he died, he died. You know, I, I, I want to just, um, I just feel especially there's somebody over the web as well that's, that's um, you need to just envision yourself as perfect. And that the, the final stage of qualification See yourselves there as that you have already reached that. And there's nothing more that God ever wants you to do for Him at all. Envision that and then speak to God. And hear what He tells you. And for the first time in your life, you'll hear the voice of God. He's come to clear our guilt away. That we can hear Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the attitude of God. Thank you that you have come to reveal the truth about man in the resurrected Jesus. 
and that we can believe that. You love us and you've demonstrated your love. Thank you that you have empowered us to preach this to people and share this with people. And above all, that we can just experience it for ourselves. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I just feel that atmosphere of innocence in this place. As we meditate upon things, we start to feel it. As you start to think upon innocence, you start to feel innocent. As you start to meditate upon the approval of God and how you are approved, you will feel approved. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are such a good God. You're such a good God. Amen, amen.